Well, good evening, um, everybody, and um, thank you, Mark, for the uh, introduction. I'm Martin Whitaker. I'm CEO of Diurnal, um, a revenue generating uh, biotech with global ambitions. In terms of the uh, company snapshot, um, we're an AIM listed company. We listed on AIM uh, in December 2015. Uh, that was our flotation price. Um, our current share price as of close yesterday was 65p uh, with a market cap of just over 100 million uh, pounds. Um, our cash position at the end of uh, March this year was 18 million pounds uh, and we have no debt. Uh, in terms of our major shareholders, uh, we're supported by long-term investors um, in the uh, pharmaceutical or biotech space, such as IP Group, uh, Polar Capital and Amati. Uh, and we have a, a well-seasoned um, board um, of directors and executive team. Uh, so myself, um, I've been with the company for 12 years, scientist by background, 20 years uh, in the industry with my expertise of taking uh, pharmaceutical products through to registration and commercialization. We have Richard Bungie as CFO, um, who also looks after business development uh, and experience of exits um, in, the, um, uh, in the pharmaceutical space, um, as highlighted by uh, the sale of Celtec to UCB. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Professor Richard Ross, uh, the founder of a company, um, a world recognized um, endocrinologist clinician uh, in the field um, of hormone uh, research. So in terms of Diurnal's focus, um, we are um, uh, a endocrinology specialty pharmaceutical company. So when we say endocrinology, uh, by that I mean um, hormones, and it's a uh, you know, potentially very large opportunity in excess of 9 billion US dollars per annum. Um, we are not tackling all um, hormone deficiencies or all hormone diseases, but initially um, we're targeting um, the cortisol deficiency um, area. And cortisol is a, um, is a key hormone for life. Without it, you'll die. And we are targeting patients that cannot produce the hormone cortisol. We're doing this with two products. Our first product um, is Alkindi, which is prim primarily focused at children. Uh, with these diseases of cortisol deficiency, a niche indication of around 0.2 billion uh, US dollars per annum. Um, Alkindi is approved and is generating revenue for the company. Uh, we have a second product, FMODI, uh, which also treats uh, these diseases of cortisol deficiency, primarily focused on adults of these diseases, a much larger market approaching 3 billion US dollars um, per annum. Uh, and this and FMODI has recently uh, received positive opinion for approval from the European Medicines Agency, uh, and we anticipate that we will launch our second product in Europe in quarter three this year. In terms of our go-to market strategy, um, we have a direct sales force in key territories in Europe, and we're forging commercial partnerships globally, which I'll talk about. We have strong commercial exclusivity based around um, orphan drug uh, status. These diseases that we are dealing with um, are rare or orphan um, and our granted patent portfolio, uh, which covers both products until 2034. Uh, and finally, we have a rich pipeline of other um, endocrine or hormone um, opportunities with our next product, uh, Ditest, uh, for treatment of low testosterone or male hypogonadism, um, progressing uh, through to um, market in the US with the regulatory uh, pathway already mapped out with the US regulator, uh, the FDA. And beyond that, uh, we have an earlier pipeline uh, that's maturing um, and uh, products that are entering into the clinic. So with those attributes, it's our vision to become a world leading endocrinology specialty pharma company. Firstly, we will establish commercial traction by our lead product candidates, Alkindi and FMODI. We will continue to develop specialist products and bring them to market, such as Ditest, and there's always potential with our um, sales team for targeted M&A um, activity to accelerate and leverage our international profile. So I'll just talk briefly about the opportunity. So why are we interested in these hormones and what are the unmet patient needs? 
Well, the endocrine system is critical to life. It's a collection of glands that produce hormones that regulate a number of very important functions in the body, ranging from growth to development to sexual function. The key thing about hormone uh, disorders is that uh, often if you are missing the hormone, either through disease or Ill health or through genetic reasons, then this leads to chronic uh, diseases which require lifelong treatment. So often if you're missing the hormone, you need to be replaced with it uh, for life. And this lifelong treatment has serious health impacts for the patient. The hormone that everyone's heard of, of course, is insulin. The disease is diabetes, absolutely huge market that's dominated by the large pharmaceutical companies who have multiple products in this area. However, at Diurnal, we spend a lot of our time uh, speaking to patients, to patient groups uh, and to clinicians. And we've identified a multitude of diseases where simply patient needs um, are currently going unmet. And these, some of these are listed here on the right hand side um, of slide eight, and these tend to be rare, orphan, uh, paediatric uh, diseases, uh, where there's actually been very little innovation over a number of, of years. And this is really where uh, diurnal and companies um, of our ilk um, operate. Often the pro typical profile of a company in this area uh, is one that will pick off one or two disease areas and develop products um, against those unmet patient needs. Uh, the benefit of operating in this area is that actually that it tends to be um, a lower competitive um, environment, yet uh, we believe that investors can make a significant re return uh, on their investment um, in these uh, niche areas. So as I mentioned, we cannot tackle all of these uh, diseases all in one go, and our initial focus is around cortisol, an essential hormone for life. Without it, uh, you'll die. Uh, and for those patients that cannot produce it, they'll need to be replaced every day for the rest of their lives with an oral treatment uh, taken by mouth to replace their cortisol uh, that they're missing in their body. There are two main causes of cortisol deficiency. Uh, the first is a group of diseases called adrenal insufficiency or AI. And this is where you lose the ability to produce cortisol during your lifetime, uh, typically caused by either an autoimmune disease called Addison's disease, uh, which attacks the adrenal gland just above the kidney, um, or there's a second group of diseases called hypopituitarism, which are caused by a benign tumour uh, in your pituitary gland just behind your brain, and that affects the signalling from your brain to your adrenal, shutting off production. The major symptoms that adrenal insufficiency patients uh, face are chronic fatigue, and it's not just you know, feeling a little bit tired, this is very debilitating uh, fatigue where 50% of patients can't work, they literally do not have the energy to get out of bed um, in the morning. And because we don't um, have enough cortisol on board in their body, when they're exposed to, for example, an infection, um, they go into what's called an adrenal crisis, uh, which often means the patient will go unconscious. Um, they may uh, require um, hospitalization. And unfortunately, each year, some of these patients do pass away. The second group of diseases of cortisol deficiency is a genetic group of diseases called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH. Uh, and these patients have two issues. Firstly, they have the chronic fatigue that AI patients suffer from because they cannot produce cortisol. Uh, and secondly, um, these patients suffer from a buildup of androgens or sex hormones um, in the body uh, that cause damage to the patient. And these androgens, they have a building blocks of cortisol and because Congenital adrenal hyperplasia patients have a genetic block, which means they cannot produce an enzyme which makes cortisol on the body. These androgens uh, buzz around the bloodstream, uh, causing damage to the patient. So, for example, if you're a little girl that's born of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, you may be born with ambiguous genitalia. So, little girls may look like little boys, and that could require corrective surgery during their lifetime. Both little boys and little girls go through puberty very early on in life perhaps the ages of five or six, so we grow very quickly as young children. But when it comes to the teenage years where puberty should occur, um, actually growth is turned off uh, and they end up being much shorter uh, than their predicted height as adults. And in adulthood, um, issues continue in terms of fertility, in terms of metabolism, cardiovascular issues, uh, and ultimately this patient group uh, will die some seven years earlier um, than the normal uh, population. So these diseases are associated with 
high mor morbidity and higher mortality. And it's really Diurnal's ambition to treat this patient group effectively for the first time ever uh, from birth, initiating with Alkindi, then transitioning onto FMOD for continued lifelong treatment. So I'll just discuss with you how we're progressing. Firstly, with Alkindi uh, in, in kids, uh, and then moving on to um, FMOD. So Alkindi, um, we believe, is a major breakthrough in treating uh, both diseases, that's paediatric adrenal insufficiency and the genetic disease, uh, CAH. Um, Alkindi is based on the active ingredient hydrocortisone, which is the synthetic version of cortisol. So we're, we're, we are replacing like for like um, in the body. And although hydrocortisone has been around for over 60 years, uh, no company has ever applied the paediatric license uh, for hydrocortisone in this patient group. So we as diurnal, uh, through developing Alkindi, really do have first mover advantage in this area. And before Alkindi was developed and licensed and made available to patients, this is an example of what patients had to take. So these are young kids uh, taking uh, crushed or compounded um, adult tablets that are, giving them, that are given to them on a daily basis. Uh, and this is you know, life-saving uh, medication. So our, that all changed with the approval of Alkindi in Europe um, in 2018. Um, Alkindi is given as a sprinkle formulation. So it's beads of drug within a capsule that you can see here on slide 12. So each capsule uh, contains uh, beads. The capsule is opened. Uh, the beads of drug are sprinkled onto the child's tongue or for older children it can be sprinkled um, onto food uh, and thereby uh, their cortisol uh, is replenished um, daily. So Alkindi was approved in 2018. It comes with a regulatory uh, privilege of 10 years data and market exclusivity uh, via what's called a pediatric use market authorization. And is also associated with two granted European patents, which extend that exclusivity all the way out to 2034. So we have long exclusivity periods um, in market. In terms of um, how we um, are marketing to uh, physicians. Um, if you are diagnosed with one of these diseases of cortisol deficiency, then often you will be referred to a specialist treatment center, particularly in Europe. And these tend to be the larger university type hospitals. And actually there are relatively few of these hospitals um, in Europe. So if we take um, the big European five countries, so the UK, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, there are 180 uh, such centers. Uh, and therefore our go-to market strategy is to target uh, these larger European territories with our own sales team. Uh, and that has already been established um, for our kindy. Um, and the typical makeup is uh, one medical science liaison person in territory um, with one uh, sales rep or CAM uh, per territory. We've achieved uh, pricing and reimbursement in a number um, of European territories already. So although um, approval is centralized and we've got a license to market to all uh, 28 European countries. We have to go into each country um, uh, on territory by territory basis to secure your price. And we've, we've been steadily doing that um, over the past uh, couple of years and happy to report that we've achieved a premium price um, for our kindy uh, in every territory that we've applied for. In those territories where the geographies are perhaps a bit more challenging, such as the Nordics, or where the populations are a bit uh, lower, such as the Benelux countries, um, we've entered into marketing and distribution agreements as the optimal way to um, enter uh, those countries. Uh, and we've signed a number of such agreements um, over the past couple of years. So, for example, with Frost Farm and the Nordics, uh, Consilient and the Benelux, and with FRX um, in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and we continue to uh, try and make um, Alkindi um, available in other uh, countries in Europe um, moving forward. In terms of our global um, ambitions, um, you know, the ambitions of diurnal um, are certainly global and the diseases uh, we treat um, have more or less equal prevalence um, around the globe. Um, we've taken a slightly different approach uh, in the US, the other major market uh, in terms of pharmaceuticals. Uh, and the optimal route, we believe, um, to accessing, accessing the US market is through licensing. Uh, and in 2020, uh, we licensed Alkindi or Alkindi Sprinkle, as it's known in the US, to 
NASDAQ listed company uh, called Eaton Pharmaceuticals uh, that specializes uh, in commercializing pediatric hospital products. Um, our relationship with Eaton um, is going uh, very well uh, and it culminated with our kindy sprinkle being approved uh, by the US regulator, the FDA um, in September 2020 uh, and launched um, in quarter four uh, last year uh, by uh, Eaton. In terms of some of the metrics of that uh, license deal, uh, we received, um, it was $5 million um, up front, uh, 3.5 million in cash, which has already been received, uh, $1.5 million in Eaton stock, uh, which we still currently uh, hold, although that's more or less doubled um, in uh, value. Um, and then beyond that, we have potential uh, sales milestones uh, approaching uh, 50 million uh, US dollars, uh, plus uh, royalties um, on uh, sales in the US. As I mentioned, our uh, progress with Eaton is going very well. And shortly after Eaton launched our Kindy Sprinkle in the US, uh, there was a lot of inbound interest uh, from physicians uh, in Canada. And in January of this year, we extended our license agreement with Eaton to include um, Canada. And that's in addition to um, other agreements that we have worldwide. Uh, for example, we have a marketing distribution agreements um, in Australia and New Zealand with Chiesi uh, and also in Israel with Medison. And indeed, our kindy is approved in both of those territories uh, and will launch um, in the next uh, six months or so. Interestingly, in Australia, our kindy was approved not just for children, but for patients of all ages um, suffering from um, um, adrenal insufficiency. Uh, and that probably highlights uh, the unmet need in this patient group. Uh, we've also um, signed a license agreement with Citri Medicine uh, for China um, and uh, a distribution agreement uh, in Turkey with uh, Kim. Uh, and we will continue to have discussions um, with regulators and potential partners um, across the globe um, for other territories, um, namely Japan, um, where we don't have a presence yet. And one of the key features of you know, marketing these specialized hospital products is that um, now that we've established um, our uh, sales infrastructure with Alkindi, uh, by and large, we will use that same sales infrastructure uh, for our second product, the larger opportunity, um, FMODI, that targets adults with these diseases of cortisol deficiency. So I'll just move on to talk about FMODI, uh, and that tackles a much larger market opportunity um, of around 3 billion uh, US dollars per annum. There are many more adults uh, with these diseases of cortisol deficiency uh, than children uh, and the way that we're approaching this market is firstly um, to seek and gain approval in the genetic disease from genital adrenal hyperplasia um, despite it being a slightly smaller market actually the patient needs are greater in that market um, and uh, we believe that the uh, clinical trials required uh, for registration um, are simpler uh, the unmet needs are greater uh, and hence we can extract uh, the optimal price uh, for our product in CAH first, before then carrying out um, subsequent um, studies and expanding the indication to adrenal insufficiency. In terms of the patient treatment needs uh, in adults versus children, uh, these are slightly different um, uh, in adults. By the time we reach adulthood, um, all of us uh, have a very distinct circadian or about the day rhythm of cortisol, uh, which is shown in um, yellow, um, on slide 15. And the cortisol rhythm is one of the most distinct rhythms uh, we have uh, in nature. It's low at night, enabling you to get to sleep. It then begins to rise from around three o'clock in the morning and peaks on or just before waking. And it's really thought to prepare the body for the day ahead, particularly in terms of energy metabolism. Then it gradually decreases uh, throughout the day and reaches an idea um, just before you go to sleep. And then it repeats again the next day. So for many years, physicians um, have understood the importance um, of this um, circadian rhythm um, of, of, of cortisol. If you have uh, these diseases, you don't have this rhythm, you have a flat line and you need to be replaced. Um, there is no standard treatment regimen uh, to treat these patients, but one common regimen is three times a day hydrocortisone, which is shown here in red. And this is given uh, as tablets first thing in the morning, lunchtime and tea time. You can see from a sawtooth profile, but it's a suboptimal um, treatment regimen. Certain times you're over-treated with drugs, certain times you're under-treated. 
uh, but importantly, um, there is no overnight coverage of cortisol. And that's really important, particularly in this genetic disease, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, where the androgens, these sex hormones that cause damage to the body, they also rise overnight from around three o'clock in the morning and peak on waking. So if you're taking any of these standard treatment regimens, um, and you take your tablet first thing in the morning, it's already too late. Um, the androgens are sky high, the damage has been done, and that's repeated day in, day out for the rest of your life. So we came up with um, F-Modi, which is a modified release hydrocortisone, which is given in what we call a toothbrush regimen. So last thing at night, first thing in the morning. And the features of the F-Modi capsule um, are that they contain beads of drug, and each bead of drug uh, is surrounded by a delayed release coat. So when you take F-Modi in the evening, there's no um, release for three to four hours. Then there's gradual release and absorption into the body to give you that peak on or, or just before waking. When you take a second capsule on waking, and that provides you with coverage um, throughout the day. And in terms of um, you know, the number of clinical trials we've carried out uh, now, seven clinical trials um, in, in human subjects with FMODI, um, nearly 240 patients uh, or subjects have been dosed. And what we've shown in these trials is that we're able to control these androgens um, across uh, the whole day, across the whole 24 hour period, bring them back down to levels uh, that are found in normal, healthy individuals. And indeed, that was the basis of our uh, positive opinion for approval uh, with the European Medicines Agency, which was announced in uh, March of this year. And we're now just awaiting the final uh, rubber stamp uh, for market authorization, uh, which we expect um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, we are now uh, ramping up uh, for uh, launch of FMODI in quarter three uh, this year um, using our existing European infrastructure uh, for direct sales and our distribution uh, infrastructure in those other territories. In terms of the UK, because we were under approval, uh, sorry, under review um, during um, the Brexit transition period end, we've applied separately to the UK a regulator, the MHRA, uh, and we did that in January of this year. Uh, and we are anticipating that we should have feedback from the MHRA again uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks as to the approval um, of FMODI. And should we be approved, um, that would enable us to then launch the product um, in, uh, in Great Britain. And finally, for the rest of the world, where our marketing and distribution agreements or licensing agreements uh, cover Alkindi and FMODI, um, we will use the European dossier to support um, local, um, uh, local um, market authorization submissions, um, and we will launch in those territories um, in due course. The one major territory uh, that's missing is the US, uh, and this is because the US regulator um, has always insisted on a separate US study involving US patients um, for approval um, across the pond. Um, we've been discussing uh, the pivotal study design, uh, which is different from the European study design uh, with the FDA um, over the past few months under what's called a special protocol um, assessment. Um, and I'm very happy to say that those discussions have gone uh, very well with the FDA um, and um, certainly from uh, the minutes and interactions that we've had with them, um, we are uh, close to agreeing the final study design and we're just waiting for the final um, output uh, written output from the SBA, which we anticipate um, in the next month or so. The design that we've agreed uh, with the FDA um, is, um, is listed here. Um, so it's different from the European study designs I mentioned. The European study design uh, was a six month um, on drug. Uh, the FDA have insisted that they'd like a, a one year study because this is a chronic indication. Um, and the uh, treatment regimen they would like us to compare ourselves to um, is twice a day um, hydrocortisone uh, and the endpoints, which are all important around the study design, are again around control of these androgens or sex hormones and bring them down into a normal uh, range. Secondary endpoints um, include um, uh, the uh, dose of steroid or hydrocortisone uh, use uh, used um, in patients to control these androgens what the regulators on both sides of the pond uh, want to see 
is that you can control the disease in terms of androgens on uh, the lowest dose of steroid uh, possible. And that's certainly something that we demonstrated um, in our European study um, that concluded about 18 months ago and was recently published um, in the Journal of Clinical um, Endocrinology um, and Metabolism. In terms of patient numbers, we're looking at around 150 congenital adrenal hyperplasia patients in around 50 uh, study centres. Um, and earlier on this month, we concluded a funding round um, of um, circa £20 million um, sterling, uh, which will fund uh, this uh, study um, all the way through uh, to conclusion uh, and through to registration. So in terms of um, how, how the outlook um, is for um, FMODI, um, both in Europe um, and in the US, um, I'll start with Europe. So if you recall, um, we've got approval coming up um, now in Europe. Um, and as soon as we've got that approval, um, we will then initiate um, a study in the wider patient group, the adrenal insufficiency patient group, uh, plan to conclude that um, in the second half of 2022, uh, and then apply for a line extension where we can market um, FMODI to that patient group. We're taking a similar approach in the US where now we have the funding uh, for the pivotal um, package, a clinical package uh, in the US um, to tackle genetic disease CAH. And again, once, that, uh, once those studies are underway, um, we will then initiate studies in the wider disease, um, adrenal insufficiency um, in the US uh, with a planned uh, line extension uh, once FMOD is approved uh, for CAH. In terms of the competitive landscape, um, in Europe, um, we will be the first um, registered um, and approved product uh, for treatment of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. In terms of a wider disease adrenal insufficiency, uh, we have one competitor in Europe, a product called Plenadren, um, which is blocking us from a market at the moment. Uh, but their exclusivity uh, runs out at the end of this year. Uh, and then from 2022 onwards, we'll be able to submit um, our data to support our market authorization um, in Europe and therefore unlock um, that uh, larger market opportunity. Uh, in the US, it's almost the opposite uh, position in terms of competition in that there are a handful of competitors uh, looking at the genetic disease, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, uh, they're using a different approach in that they are developing androgen lowering drugs. So they're only treating or addressing one issue uh, that uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia patients face, that of high androgens. But as, as you recall, uh, these patients have two issues. They also need to be replaced with cortisol um, so we don't have an adrenal crisis. So um, FMODI is able to um, address both issues, whereas these competitors only address one. And ultimately, we believe that even if these uh, competitors do get to market, um, they still need to be taken with a steroid treatment, such as FMODI, um, and we see these um, uh, we see these products as complementary. Um, and uh, finally, um, I'll move on to DiTest, which is our third product for treatment of low testosterone or male hypogonadism. A potentially a large market opportunity, particularly in the US. Although it's a large opportunity, it's also a fragmented opportunity um, where patients have many treatment choices ranging from gels uh, to creams uh, to skin patches, but each one of these has its own drawbacks. So for example, the gels and the creams um, have got safety concerns because they can uh, rub off onto patients' partners uh, or onto patients' children and the FDA doesn't like that. The injections are painful and the skin patches cause irritation. If you speak to any uh, patient, they would like to have an oral testosterone therapy as their replacement. However, testosterone is very readily degraded by the liver and not much gets into the bloodstream where it's needed to carry out its action. So some companies have developed uh, modified testosterones or testosterone and decanoates um, to overcome uh, this issue. Uh, the, the first of which was approved in Europe about 10 years ago by Bayer. Uh, called Andriel Tester Cap, but has actually found limited use in this patient population uh, because firstly, um, it's got highly variable levels of testosterone in the blood. Uh, and secondly, patients need to take a high fat meal for optimal absorption, which the patients don't like. So at Dional, we came up with an alternative strategy in that we used um, a, um, 
uh, we used a oral native testosterone uh, to overcome this issue. Um, and the formulation looks a little bit like a cod liver oil um, capsule. So it's a liquid fill uh, formulation, uh, which firstly can solubilize um, more testosterone, so you can pack more testosterone in per capsule. And secondly, it overcomes this first pass uh, liver metabolism. So that when we um, tested dye test in our target patient population, 24 adult men uh, with low testosterone um, in the UK, uh, what we showed was that dye test achieved testosterone levels within the healthy young male adult normal range, which is very reassuring. We also had a comparator arm in the study of these oral testosterone undecanoates, and we showed that dye test was less variable than the undecanoates. Importantly, we showed that dye test could be taken both with and without food, and we achieved the same levels of testosterone in the bloodstream, a major difference between us and the undecanoates. And finally, uh, we had some very good safety signals uh, for dye test versus the undecanoate. So we took this very positive data to uh, the US regulator, the FDA, and we had a pre-IND meeting uh, in the middle of 2020, uh, and that yielded um, two important things for us. Uh, firstly, the FDA confirmed the regulatory route all the way through to registration for a product, which is called the 505B2 route, which means that we can use diurnal generated data, but also historical and bibliographical data um, available in the public domain to support um, our application, and that de-risks the program significantly, both in terms of clinical risk, uh, financial risk, and also in terms of timing. And secondly, uh, the FDA confirmed that for the diurnal generated data, we just need two further clinical studies before we're in a position to submit our data um, for a market authorization submission. And the first one of those studies, which is a multiple ascending dose study, um, is already funded um, by diurnal. Um, and uh, we are due to start um, in the second half um, of this year um, in the US. Uh, then we need to go back and see the regulator. And then there's a final uh, phase three study, which either we could carry out um, or we could potentially partner uh, with a company with interests in the testosterone space. Beyond these three products, we have an earlier stage uh, pipeline of opportunities, uh, which I'll just cover off very briefly. Uh, these range uh, from uh, hypothyroidism, a very common um, endocrine disorder, uh, particularly prevalent in women um, over 60, uh, where these patients are missing uh, two thyroid hormones, a T3 and T4. Uh, the mainstay of current treatment is T4 um, therapy. Uh, we are developing what would be the world's first uh, modified release T3 ther therapy to go alongside um, the T4. And we hope to move that into the clinic during 2022. Uh, we also have um, opportunities around um, cortisol excess. So too much cortisol um, is, uh, is bad for you as well. So-called Cushing's disease. Um, and there we have an oligonucleotide ther a therapy and a biologic therapy, uh, which is very much at a preclinical stage, <clears throat> but has already achieved orphan drug uh, designation uh, in Europe and will seek to take that forward um, in due course. So to finish up uh, with the outlook, um, here's the outlook for the rest of 2021. Um, we are looking at the positive, um, we are looking at uh, including uh, sorry, we've had the positive opinion for approval of FMODI from the European Medicines Agency. Uh, we'll hope to achieve the license uh, shortly uh, and launch in quarter three of this year. And then our eyes turn really to the US in terms of our two major studies that we're looking at there. Uh, firstly, FMODI, um, so uh, concluding the SBA process and starting the study for this year. Uh, and secondly, um, starting the dye test um, study in the US. So uh, plenty of news flow to come uh, for diurnal uh, this year, moving into 2022. Um, and with that, I'd like to just uh, finish there, but really to sort of summarise what diurnal is about, is that we're building a global endocrinology specialty pharma company. We have already established a strong base in orphan diseases with our products, Alkindi and F Modi. Uh, we have a credible market access strategy, which we've executed already with Alkindi, uh, and we have opportunities to broaden uh, the offering uh, with a strong uh, pipeline of product opportunities, or perhaps opportunities to bring on additional third party products. And importantly, uh, we have a strong team with the ability to deliver. So with that, um, I'll stop there. I'll hand over to Mark, and I'm very happy to take any questions.
Thanks very much for a very interesting presentation, Martin. Um, we have a, a small number of questions so far. If anyone else would like to ask a question, can I remind you to click the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, uh, and you can type your question in. So we'll kick off. There are a couple of questions from Matt Robertson. Uh, the first one is, which, in which countries are you seeing the fastest uptake of Alkindi? Yeah, so the, the fastest uptake of Alkindi uh, that we're seeing is in the UK um, and Germany. Um, that's where Alkindi was uh, launched uh, first. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, accessing hospitals during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, has been tricky for us and other um, companies that have got hospital-based products. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, when we reported our half-year results um, earlier on this year, uh, we still saw you know, over 20% growth uh, year on year uh, in Germany and in, um, and in the UK. Thanks very much. Uh, next question from Matt is, how has access to GPs affected the rates of referral to specialist treatment centres during COVID? Uh, when do you see GPs and this system returning to normal? Yes, I think good questions. I think partly answered by my previous uh, by my previous answer is that um, actually these these patients are usually very quickly referred on to specialist treatment centres and then are under the treatment of a either a specialist uh, paediatric endocrinologist if they're if they're under eighteen um, or an adult endocrinologist um, if they're over eighteen. Um, so what we've seen is that. Um, and typically, you know, patients, if they're paediatric, they'll see their, 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 their doctor every three to six months. If they're adult and stable on treatment, they'll see um, their doctor annually. Uh, the issue that uh, it's been for these patients is, is patients getting into hospital to see their specialist. Um, so, uh, so, so no issues with the GPs uh, because the, the patients don't reside there. They, they reside around the hospitals and that's been, that's been the key. As we see restrictions easing uh, in the pandemic, uh, as we've seen particularly in the UK the past um, you know, uh, few weeks, uh, then we hope that those patients um, can you know, catch up on their uh, appointments that they've missed um, over the past 12 months or so. Thanks, Martin. Uh, then we have a number of rather more technical questions from Tim Grattan. Uh, first of all, would there be any rationale for looking at Alkindi or Fmodi for other indications for which hydrocortisone is currently indicated. For example, reduction of inflammation and pruritus associated with eczema or atopic dermatitis, and in particular for, for nocturnal use where pruritus may interfere with sleep. Well, I think that's an excellent question from Tim and, and you know, hydrocortisone um, being um, a, you know, a steroid is one of the most widely prescribed um, anti-inflammatory treatments uh, globally. Uh, the, and yes, there will absolutely, we believe there'll be utility in other disease areas. Uh, but the key for us um, is, has been to really get um, Alkindi and more recently FMODI approved. That really, um, you know, gets us a foot in the door with an approved product. And then from there, we will seek to expand to other indications. So I talked about adrenal insufficiency, where it's a very defined indication that's related to a congenital adrenal hyperplasia. That's our next goal. Um, but if you look on our website, we've also talked about, you know, other applications for inflammatory diseases, such as rheumatoid um, diseases as well. So we're formulating our plans at the moment uh, and we'll update the market um, uh, in the future. Very interesting. Thanks, Martin. Uh, then some more from Tim. Uh, can you remind us why hydrocortisone is used rather than cortisol for the Alkindi indications? given that the condition is a result of a cortisol deficiency? Yeah, so cortisol and hydrocortisone are the same molecule. Uh, one, if it occurs naturally in the body, it's called cortisol. Uh, and if it's made synthetically, then it's called hydrocortisone. Uh, but they are absolutely the same molecule. Um, and we are replacing like for like um, in the body. Um, and that gives us a key advantage um, in both paediatrics and adult treatment um, in that um, if you use more potent synthetic um, steroids such as prednisolone or dexamethasone, uh, and these tend to have uh, more serious side effects uh, than hydrocortisone replacement treatment. Thank you. Um, 
Then Tim is asking who markets Plenadren and what technology does Plenadren use for controlled hydrocortisone delivery? Have you any data showing either equivalence or superiority versus Plenadren? Again, a very good question uh, from Tim. So uh, in terms of uh, the marketing of Planadren, it's currently marketed um, by Takeda. It was part of the Shire portfolio of products. Uh, and before that, it was part of the um, a US company called Vera Pharma. Uh, and before that, um, a Swedish company called Duocourt. Uh, in terms of the technology, it's um, a dual um, core tablet. So it's not uh, so it's different from FMOD, which is a capsule. Um, and the tablet, uh, is really designed to uh, eliminate those three peaks that I showed you in my presentation. Um, so you just have one, one peak and then a gradual uh, release of the drug. Um, we've not generated any data against Plenadren yet, um, but uh, the study that I showed or uh, very briefly um, in the uh, Gantt chart uh, in terms of the one required for uh, indication expansion in Europe will be a head-to-head -head study of FMODI versus Plenadren. So uh, data will be on its way during 2022. Great, thanks. Uh, next is a question from Barry Foster. Um, are you pleased with the initial results from Eaton that were announced in the past week, given that it is difficult to operate in the current pandemic situation in the USA? Yeah, so I think in general, we've been very impressed um, with Eaton um, as, a, as a partner. Um, uh, our kindy sprinkle for Eaton is a big deal. It will make the product will make a real big difference um, to them and the growth trajectory of that uh, company. In terms of the Eaton experience in this area, as I alluded to, uh, they're specialists in um, marketing hospital uh, pediatric um, drugs, uh, and importantly, um, in uh, as part of um, one of their other products, uh, they were also instrumental in taking compounded or crushed product off the market, uh, working with the FDA. So we've got a lot of experience and relevant experience in this area. In terms of what was discussed on the Eaton call, uh, earnings call um, um, last week, was that they are targeting um, 400 patients uh, to be on product um, this year in the US. Uh, and that's out of a patient population of what we believe is around 4,000 patients. Um, so that's very much within our expectations. Um, but as with any, you know, uh, product launch, it's very early on in the cycle. We've only got, um, you know, really one full quarter's worth of data. Uh, and I think, um, you know, if Eaton can achieve um, or exceed their 400 patients uh, this year in the US, um, we'll be very pleased about progress, very much in line with our expectations. Very good. Okay. Uh, then next is from uh, Steve Bakovlia. Uh, what sales revenue would be regarded as a success in 2021, 22, and 23? Um, so I think in terms of the sales revenue, um, I mean, we don't, we sort of don't guide to that, although there is um, analyst research available on our website um, that, that gives sort of a range of, um, a range of sales. I mean, what I can say is that um, in, in terms of our current funding that we have, um, that is sufficient funding to take um, Alkindi in Europe uh, and FMODI in Europe, plus the licensing and distribution um, income worldwide. Um, it's enough to take us through to profitability for that franchise uh, by our financial year um, 2023. Um, so, and then anything that we do uh, over and above that um, is additional. So we've just raised money, for example, for the for the US trial. So again, that's funded all the way through to, to US approval, um, we hope. Um, so really, we don't see, you know, any need for any sort of future uh, fundraising unless it's for, you know, a specific uh, mm -hmm. clinical trial moving forward. But I think we've got a very strong um, European franchise around, um, in particular around uh, Alkindi and FMODI. So the answer for Steve is to have a look at the research on your website. And you'll find yes, but I think it's to sort of just say, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're yeah. moving towards, you know, you know, profitability mm. and that profitability is, you know, two to three years away. Sure. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, a question from Alex Stephen Haynes. Uh, were, Diurn were Diurnal pleased with Ethan's recent Q1 results regarding Alkindi sprinkle prescriptions in the US? 
Yeah, so I think I just referred to my sort of previous answer for Alex, but I think, you know, very early in the cycle, um, you know, what we've seen is that, um, you know, um, Eaton, um, you know, just two months after approval, made the product available um, to patients at the end of uh, 2020. Um, we're pleased, very pleased with their progress. Uh, but like I say, if they can hit their 400 or 400 plus uh, patients on our kindy sprinkle by the end of uh, this calendar year, um, we'll be that will be very much in line with our expectations. Super. Uh, and then a further question from Alex. Uh, what is the company's approach to obtaining orphan drug status for the drugs being developed? Is this a priority? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I mean, what, um, what orphan drug status uh, potentially gives a product um, is 10 years um, uh, data, ex uh, sorry, 10 years uh, market exclusivity in Europe and seven years uh, market exclusivity in the US. Um, we hold the designations um, for all of the um, different diseases and CAH and AI um, are classed as two separate um, orphan diseases. So we hold all the designations um, on both sides of the pond and also for pediatric adrenal insufficiency as well. Um, when it comes to um, you know, the market, um, you know, it doesn't really affect, you know, our ability to commercialize or to command um, a premium price, as we've shown with our kindy, that doesn't have orphan drug um, status associated with it in Europe, yet we've achieved, you know, a very good price and we've been able to launch it um, everywhere where we've, um, where we wanted to launch it um, in, in, in Europe. Um, if, if we achieve um, the orphan drug status, we see that very much as a bonus. It's a, it's a, um, a higher level uh, so it's a higher barrier to entry, I should say, for any potential competitors uh, coming in, uh, but it's not essential. You know, we have um, the granted patent portfolio, uh, which protects us all the way out to, uh, to 2034. Um, but if we can uh, secure it, um, either Europe, UK or US, uh, then clearly, you know, that um, adds another layer of exclusivity um, and we'll pursue it where we can. Thanks, Martin. Well, that, that wraps up the, the questions. Um, we've got a few minutes left. So if you'd like to say any uh, closing remarks uh, summarizing the investment case for, for Diurnal, um, please feel welcome to do so. Yeah, well, I won't keep every, you know, everybody too long and, and, and hanging on, but I think, um, you know, just to sort of, you know, reinstate uh, what we said, you know, we're a, you know, a very well uh, run company. Uh, we've now um, got, uh, one product to market, second product shortly to follow, and a very rich um, uh, opportunity of, of pipeline uh, products uh, to come um, as well. We've just had a recent uh, fundraising, um, which concluded uh, this month, uh, and that covers off the US trial. Um, and beyond that, you know, as I mentioned, um, the European um, cortisol franchise, as we call it, is, is funded through to profitability. So. Um, you know, we believe we're in a very strong uh, position to make, you know, a large impact um, on the global scene. Uh, and that's exemplified by the breadth of our um, uh, agreements, either license agreements or distribution agreements, but we've secured uh, worldwide. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, well, wish you every success with the business. Uh, it sounds like some exciting opportunities ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark.